86 is here, and I hope that you are uh, in gear expecting some great things to happen. I've got some wants for you in 1986. I would seriously question the worth of a pastor who had no wants for his people as they enter a new year. And I have many, many wants for you. And they kind of hinge around seeing you really get with it. I look at this congregation and I believe without doubt we are probably more tuned in to real life and real living than any place in this town. I don't say that out of pride, that's just a statement of fact. That's like saying, you know, you're five foot nine, weigh 246 pounds. That's a statement of fact. And I believe that is a, is a, a proper description of this church. We're tuned into what's going on around us, somewhat. Not nearly what we ought to be. And when I study the life of Jesus, and I'm, I'm into that more right now, and will be for quite some time because of this reading program that many of us are on. And I hope that maybe you might decide you're going to join with us, with the deacons and with the staff and with my kids. I also gave one of those Bibles to my kids. Rachel got all over me for saying, you didn't tell folks that you gave us one of those too, Dad. So I did. And that reading daily, right now, Genesis, Matthew, Psalms, why don't you put me on this thing? Because that other thing has fallen apart on me. Okay? You okay with that? Yeah. Hello. You're up there, aren't you? I know you are. That's why we keep this one here and you guys are ready to go. I did get a, a word from the Bible House the other day that some of you have gone to get a, a copy of that one-year Bible and they don't have any down there. And I tried to warn them. I told them. I called them on Monday and said I told people yesterday I hadn't planned to do that but I told them yesterday that I'd given these as gifts to my staff and my deacons and, and I, I just want to warn you you better order some and I understand they're already out and, but there will be more and you can get in on that program but when you read and study the life of Jesus you see him constantly laboring among the people I wish a lot of seminary profs had the courage to study the life of Jesus and see where he worked and operated. They'd get out of those ivory towers and get down and get with the real people, not with a bunch of scholars to discuss some Greek verb. They'd get down there and find out what's going on with the plumbers and the painters and the salesmen and the executives and the housewives and find out what's happening because that's where Jesus lived. In Luke chapter 5... Verses 27 to 31, we read this little story about Jesus. And this is just kind of the springboard for where I'm going. And I, I really plan to, uh, to go fast, so you've got to stay with me today. But I've got a lot to say, and my heart is really full of what needs to be said to us to get us moving in the right direction. You don't pass the crucial points without helping your people get a fix on where they need to be going. And I see Jesus here, he left town and he saw a tax collector with the usual reputation for cheating sitting at a tax collection booth. Now that was part and parcel of being a tax collector, you were a cheat. Everybody knew it and it's just the way it was, Jesus knew it too. And he looked at this fellow and, and instead of looking at him and saying, you dirty crud, you are a miserable crud go somewhere and crawl in a hole and pull it in after you. Jesus looked at him, and, and, and here's his name. His name is Levi, and Jesus looked at him and said, come be one of my disciples. You guys say, come on. Jesus, you're smarter than that. Don't you know this guy's history? Don't you know his background? Don't you understand that he's not ever going to get well from being this miserable cheat that he is? Jesus says, come be one of my disciples. And Levi left everything and jumped up and went with Jesus. And soon Levi held a reception in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor and many of Levi's fellow tax collectors also with the usual reputation for cheating were there. But the Pharisees, the religious order, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. This gang is a gutless bunch. You watch them all through the New Testament, they operate out of gutlessness. They couldn't go to Jesus and say, Jesus, let me tell you something. They had to talk to his disciples, but they talked loud enough so he could overhear. 
he shouldn't be eating with these notorious sinners. And Jesus answered them. The disciples didn't have to answer. Isn't it a great thing to understand? You don't have to defend Jesus. You don't have to defend God. You know, the world is full of Christians running around. They're going to defend the Bible. What a waste motion that is. If I've got to defend God, he's in trouble. Do you know that? Huh? And if you've got to defend him, he's in trouble. You don't have to defend him. And Jesus spoke up and he said, it's the sick who need a doctor, not those in good health. My purpose is to invite sinners to turn from their sins, not to spend my time with those who think themselves already good enough. That ought to be a clue to us in how we deal with people. If you're dealing with somebody that absolutely thinks they are so good, they do not need the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe it's a good idea for you to just kind of shake the dust off and say, well, pal, if you ever wake up and decide you need the Lord, I'm around. I just sat in my office a few minutes ago with a man whose son I buried the day before Christmas. He's been in, in church both Sundays since I buried his son. I dropped by the job to see him this past week. He wasn't there. He hadn't been back to work yet since the death of his son. But as I saw him this morning in the early service and I reached over and tapped him on the shoulder, he immediately said, thanks for coming by to see me. I'm sorry I missed you. See, if we're not out there laboring like Jesus did out where the people are, it doesn't happen. And when that service was over this morning, he came into my office and he said, friend, I've never been a believer, but I am hurting so bad. And he said, maybe it's wrong to come out of all of this hurt, but I'm hurting so bad, I gotta have some help. We've got an appointment Tuesday night at seven o'clock, 7.30 in my office to talk about his need for Jesus Christ in his life. I believe that man's gonna come to the Lord. But I believe that's where you do the work. You do the work seeing people in their workplace, going into their home, being in their place. And I look at this thing here, and, and it's my springboard for where I want to go to Matthew chapter 9 this morning, because I want to lay out some principles for you, and then I want to give you 10 things quickly to write down that will be tied together with what you're going to, to be doing this week. You see, the importance to understand what Jesus understood, you've got to see the needs. In Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35, it says Jesus traveled around through all the cities and villages of that area, teaching in the Jewish synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And wherever he went, he healed people of every sort of illness. And what pity he felt for the crowds that came because their problems are so great and they didn't know what to do or where to go for help. They were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, in the first place, we have to get to where we see the needs. We have to see the needs. Jesus saw their needs. I wonder as you move through life, do you see the helpless do you see the people that are caught in a rut? Do you see the people that are hating to see Monday arrive when they've got to go to work? And they hate that job and they hate that boss and they hate that paycheck, they hate the whole thing, but they've got to do it in order to keep going? You see, when, when we talk about seeing the needs, we think about the poor. People have less of this world's goods. We don't see people that are absolutely so needy that they're wiped out, they're destroyed inside because they need help and they don't know where to go to get it. They're not living, they're just existing, they're all stressed out. And what is the world offering to them? Well, if, if you watch TV today, I'm sure you'll see one of those great beer commercials. One of those great commercials that has a bunch of guys sitting around a campfire, forgotten what brand they're drinking, but you probably know. They've all got a can of it in their hand, and one of them is saying to the group, guys, it just doesn't get any better than this. That's horse feathers. It doesn't get any better than that. I mean, if you could see that same group two hours later, you can see them looking at one another and saying, guys, it just doesn't get any better than this, now, does it? And if you can see them about two hours later, you can see them in a fist fight and puking on one another, and some guys say, it really is good, isn't it? Don't you bear this? <laughs> That's real life, people. That's where they live. They don't have another thing. And they fight their way, and they hate that boss, and they hate that job, and they go through the hell of those five days so they can get those two days off somewhere hiding out doing their own thing because life doesn't have anything more to offer them than that. 
And we don't see their need. We don't see their need. You got to be with the unbelievers. I want to ask you a question. Does your, your close mix involve any time with unbelievers? Or is all your close mix with believers? Hey, it's great being with believers. It is more fun just being with believers. Marvelous to get together with that crowd. Put your arms around one another and sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And say, man, it's wonderful to be here with you. It's a whole lot easier than being out there with that crowd that doesn't know the Lord and, and they don't know where they're going, don't know what they're doing. Statistics tell us that within, within two years of conversion, most believers lose all real touch with unsaved people. And I dare to say that's true in this congregation. I mean, you're with them, but you're not with them. You don't spend any in-depth time. You don't talk to them about anything that really counts. You talk about the weather. You talk about who's going to win between the Giants and the Bears. It was 7 nothing at the end of the half. Bears. That dumb Giants field goal kicker missed one from 14 yards out. <laughs> Pathetic. How the fortunes change. That guy, you know, that guy Schubert is his name. He was a high school coach. Their field kicker got on the fritz and they brought this guy in to kick field goals for him. He kicked five in a row in one game. Since then, it's been all downhill. He has missed his last six out of seven, counting that one he missed today. That's a tough life. Mitch, you used to kick field goals. You understand that. You kicked them, though. You didn't just kick at them. You see, it's all right to know those things that are going on. But until we understand how to get close enough to people so they're willing to share what's going on in their guts and willing to talk to us about the areas of hurt in their life until they know we care that much. We're not going to make a dent. Jesus knew that. He stayed out there with the unbelievers. He knew what it was to spend time alone with his disciples. He knew what it was to spend time alone with his heavenly Father. But he also knew what it was to spend tremendous amounts of time out there with the people where the great need was. Do you? It says that he felt great pity for the crowds that came. Some translations say great compassion for those who came. You see, when, when we begin to think about the needy, we think about the poor. We think about, yeah, I got a bunch of things for Christmas. I ought to clean out my closet and take it to the general store. Yes, you should. But if that's the end of the line, if you're thinking about the poor, friend, you haven't got message number one yet. Until you can begin to see the needy on your level of life, on the income level on which you live, that live in your neighborhood, and begin to see that those folks are looking desperately for some way to come to a place of belief, and they have no clue of which way to go. One of the great things about that man sitting in my office this morning, he said, Buf, I know I have great need. I don't even know where to start. I said, buddy, you do too. You're in the right place. He's in the right place. But I'll tell you how he knew he was in the right place. When I went by that shop the other day and he wasn't in, they said he hasn't been in since his boy was killed. I saw him sitting back there in the early service. He was sitting two rows in from the back. It's hard to reach in there, but I reached in and grabbed him by the shoulder. He turned around, his first remark was, thanks for coming to see me. Why? I know there's an unbelievable amount of hurt in that man's heart. And my heart goes out to him. I have no concept of what it would be to have two kids dead and not know they're with the Lord. I have no concept of, of, of how to handle that. I'll tell you one thing, I wouldn't be preaching. I'd sell it all and go to Vegas and raise hell till it was over. Now, that's what I'd do if I didn't know the Lord. There's no way I could just chug along through life. I don't know how people keep chugging along when they have no faith and they have no way to go. And when I look at Jesus' example of his love reaching out to help those in need and seeing the staggering needs, and then listen to his words in verse 37. He said, the harvest is so great and the workers are so few. 
So pray to the one in charge of harvesting and ask him to recruit more workers for his harvest field. Are you doing any praying that God will recruit more workers? I'm not saying for God to bring more, more Mitches along to say I'm going to the ministry. I'm saying to get more believers off the dime to say, I am a believer. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I know the word of God. I will share the word of God. I'm going to get seriously interested in the lives of people on my level of life and share the good news with them. I will become a laborer in the field. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Boy, what a great passage this is. When he's right, and one of the reasons I love this guy so much is because I see this picture and, and God has used this so much in my own life to help me understand what the primary responsibility of a believer is. Not to sit around and debate major theological issues, it's to go out there and deal with people who have needs. Look what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 17. Or in verse 19, he said, I'm not bound to, to obey anyone just because he pays my salary. I feel exactly the same way. I will be the leader. God has called me to a place of leadership. I will listen to good advice. I will gather good people around me on staff and on a deacon board, and I will dig into your mind for advice on various issues, but I am not in a situation where I'm bound to obey anyone just because he pays my salary. Yet I have freely and happily become a servant of any and all so that I can win them to Christ. When I am with the Jews, I seem as one of them so that they will listen to the gospel and I could win them to Christ. I want to learn how to do that. I don't know how to do that with Jews. I want to know how to do it. But I don't understand all that yet. Paul was one, so he understood all that. He said, when I'm with Gentiles who follow Jewish customs and ceremonies, I don't argue even though I don't agree because I want to help them. When with the heathen, I agree with them as much as I can, except, of course, that I must always do what is right as a Christian, and so by agreeing, I can win their confidence and help them also. When I'm with those whose consciences bother them easily, I don't act as though I know it all and don't say they're foolish. The result is that they're willing to let me help them. Yes, whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him so that he will let me tell him about Christ and will let Christ save him. Do you hear that? I try to find the common ground so that he'll let me, not to come along and have to force this message down him, he'll let me tell him about Christ, and then he'll let Christ save him. See, most people don't understand that Jesus really wants to save them. They, they don't understand this story of Levi, this rotten, cruddy tax collector, and Jesus said, come follow me. And we have gotten to where we are so judgmental, so we look at a guy and say, that old boy, he's heading for hell. No way he's going to get saved. And Paul looked for the common ground so that the guy would let him tell him about Christ and then that the guy would, would let Christ save him once he found out what he was. And then Paul said, that I do this for two reasons. One is to get the gospel out to them and also for the blessing I myself receive when I see them come to Christ. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what. If I had an opportunity to teach a pastor's seminar where they're all worried about burnout, there's no bunch in the world more worried about burnout than pastors. Do you know that? Oh, they're carrying such a heavy load. Life is so tough. It's a difficult job running a church, you know. Get all these people yelling at you. Everybody trying to please them all. Well, you fool, you shouldn't try to please them all. You can't anyhow. There's no need to try. But I'm going to tell you how to beat burnout. There's how you beat burnout right there. You get the gospel out, you obey the Lord, and you get the blessing when you see them come to Christ. Hey, that'll beat burnout 40 ways to Sunday. It's really no great secret of how to beat burnout. Just be in the business doing what God called you to do. And that's why Paul never burned out. They cut his head off, and that did momentarily interrupt his ministry. <laughs> However, he continues to go because of the great legacy he left behind of having done the work and the will of God consistently while he was here. Do you see Fresno as a part of God's harvest field? Well, you say, well, it's a nice town, better than average. Crime rate's better than some. A lot of folks go to church. You're probably not aware of the fact that most folks don't go to church in this wonderful town. Most folks today have not entered any place of worship. The higher percentage have not gone anywhere. Most of your neighbors are not in church anywhere. Most of your neighbors know little about Jesus. 
and you've been a neighbor to them for umpteen years and they still know little or nothing about Jesus and you've never talked to them personally about Jesus Christ. Pray for laborers. Hmm. Are you willing to become a laborer where you are? I don't mean to get up and go to Africa. To be a laborer right here in Fresno, right here within the confines of this city where you can funnel folks into this place where they can get growth and help and development to become the kind of people they want to become. You willing to become one of those? If you start praying about it, it may start happening in your life. I've got several things. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Your assignment this week is to read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, down through chapter 6, verse 10. That's in addition to the one-year Bible reading for staff and deacons. I just want you to know that, okay? And kids, okay? And others who may want to join in. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 to chapter 6, verse 10, has six things that the laborer in the kingdom of God is. That's his character. And then it has four things that he does. That's his behavior. I want you to just listen. You may want to scribble. You may want to get a tape next week. But I want you to listen to these very carefully because you need to get this straight in your mind. You're a believer. If you're not a believer, you just hang on. I'm going to get to you before I quit. But you're a believer. You need this message. You need some place to hang your hat for 1986. You need some place to get going for 1986. Six things the laborer in the kingdom of God is. First of all, verse 17, chapter 5, 2 Corinthians. He is a brand new person inside. That's what you became the day you were born again. Whether that day was yesterday, 15 years ago, 9 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. Brand new person inside. That's what you are. Inside, brand new. The outside still may be pretty cruddy, but inside, you're brand new. Secondly, verse 11 and 12. Boy, he says, he says, God knows our hearts that they're pure in this matter of wanting to win people to Christ, and I hope that deep within you really know it too. There is a pureness of heart, and there's an honesty. There's a transparency that is true in the life of the believer who's really walking with God and intent on doing the work and the will of God. Thirdly, Verse 13, he says, we are, are, are we insane to say such things about ourselves? If so, it is to bring glory to God. And if we're in our right minds, it's for your benefit. And whatever we do, it's certainly not for our own profit, but because Christ's love controls us now. Mentally consumed with God and his work. Do you have any concept of what would happen in this city if just the Northwest congregation decide I'm going to be mentally consumed with God and his work? I'm going to think about the work of God. I'm going to think about the will of God. I'm going to think about what I ought to be doing. I'm going to stop deciding that I've done my bit. If I go to Bethel or I sing in the choir or work in the nursery or I teach a class, I'm going to start understanding I have major responsibility to share the good news of Jesus Christ with non-believers. Folks, you're not doing it. You're not doing it. I believe the commission to the individuals in the church is to do this. I don't for one minute believe, and, and I may just step on your toe a little, there's a bunch of folks in town decided they're going to bring an evangelist to town. They're going to spend a half a million dollars for eight days to bring an evangelist to town and do a big job this fall. I am not for it. I will not support it because I believe that responsibility is right here inside the church. And I'm not about to say, let's get involved in squandering a half a million dollars when it won't do the job. Most of the folks I know won't go down there to hear an evangelist. They'll go down there to hear, see those dogs fumble around. Boy, they fumbled around last night. We lucked out. That can wear a preacher out and make you too tired to preach on Sunday, that kind of thing going on. <laughs> but I was the only one there, only preacher there, so I think it's okay. <laughs> See, I don't think most folks are going to run down to that arena to hear an evangelist. I don't care who he is. Billy wouldn't fit down there. Anybody else isn't going to draw them in. It isn't going to happen. That's our job to win them one-to-one, -one, not try to bring them in some big place and have a guy throw a hook out and drag them in. 
And if we are mentally consumed with God and his work like believers ought to be, this isn't written to full-time Christian workers, my friend. This is written to believers, full-time believers. And it's time some of you decided, yes, I am a full-time believer. Fourth, controlled by Christ's love. A laborer is controlled by Christ's love. Notice what he says, Christ's love controls us now. I'm going to tell you something, folks. When that begins to operate, Christ's love controlling you, it demonstrates in every area of your life. Your attitude. I met with a dear lady in the hospital this week, 85 years old, visiting us from South Dakota. And as she walked across the street last Sunday, her hip broke and she fell to the street, had to go to the hospital, have surgery and all of that. I had this information, knew she was 85, made a call on her. I said, Hazel, you're 85 years old. She said, yes, sir. I said, you don't look it, honey. I had had just enough conversation with her that I knew what her attitude was toward life. Not bucking and fighting and yelling and screaming against everything. She said, hey, this happened. I'm going to have to be in, in California a little longer than I planned. This thing's going to heal up, and I'm going to be okay. I said, your face doesn't in any way, I said, you could be 20 years younger than you are just by looking at you. That has to tell me something about the attitude of your life toward the Lord and toward the things he brings in. I tell you, I had a marvelous time with that lady. The love of Christ controlling your life makes a difference whether you're in the good side or on the tough side. That's part of what God wants to do through us if we'll let him. Number five, verse 20, chapter five, you're an ambassador of Christ. He said, we are Christ's ambassadors. That is not an optional deal. You may decide, yes, I'll take that too. Like, yes, I'll go to the Bethel thing. Or yes, I'll sing in the choir. This is not optional. You become a believer. You are an ambassador of Christ. Part of the package. And in chapter 6 and verse 1, you're a partner with God in sharing this message. Look what it says. As God's partners, we beg you not to toss aside this marvelous message of God's great kindness. You're a partner with God. Over the years, I've sat many times with businessmen who were in partnerships who are having trouble. Partnerships give rise to trouble. You know that, don't you? Because it's so easy to look at your partner and say, I'm working my tail off and this slob is coming in working about four hours a day. And I'm really irritated because I'm working so hard and he's not doing much at all. And the business is going down the drain and it's his fault. And the other guy is saying, man, I'm just kind of coasting, but this guy is working so hard he's an absolute raving maniac. There's no way to get along with him. And the partnership is all fouling up because the partners aren't working together. I'm going to guarantee you one thing. God is doing his share of the job. When you see yourself as a partner with God in sharing the message of God's great kindness, you ought to be throwing your hat in the air and saying, glory to God, I had no idea of my marvelous position. I am in partnership with God Almighty. He is the senior partner, to be sure, but I'm in partnership with him. Instead of that, we don't even acknowledge that. We see ourselves as some kind of a little peon, a little nothing. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm the least of the least of the least. And somebody else comes along and says, I want to tell you something. You know what you are? You're the least of the least of the least. You want to punch them out, see? Because one thing, if you say it about yourself because you're hiding from responsibility, something else that they're saying it about you. Four things that a laborer does. Those are six things that he is. Four things that he does. Number one, he fears the Lord. That's verse 11. It is because of this solemn fear of the Lord which is ever present in our minds. See, when you read the book and begin to understand who God is and how much he loves you, it's a pretty overwhelming thing. When I spoke at the downtown Rotary Club at the Christmas program, after I had finished speaking, John Backus came up to sing. 
John is a great Greek Orthodox priest, a beloved brother in Christ. Great voice. And he stood up to sing, O Holy Night, and he had this canned music going. In the middle of that second verse, he lost it. He couldn't go on. The music kept going. He finally picked it up and finished. And afterward, I went to him and I said, John, I really enjoyed the song. And he said, I apologize for not being able to carry on. But he said, as I was singing, I began to think about Jesus Christ, the King, that he was willing to come and be born in that manger in order to redeem my soul. And he said, it got too much for me. You see, that is fearing, honoring, respecting, understanding who the Lord is and how much he has loved you. That's one thing that a laborer does. Secondly, he works hard to win others. It's because of the solemn fear of the Lord ever present that we work hard to win others. Are you working hard to win others? That's a good question, fair. Are you working hard to win others or are you just doing your own thing? You're so busy with business and busy with family and busy with little, little things to occupy your time. We've never lived in an era in this country like we do now where people are trying to find a way to fill up 24 hours a day. They belong to this club and that club and the other club and this club and they do this and do that and spend money and spend time and all of this except doing the work and the will of God. And that responsibility here that rests upon us to work hard to win others. Thirdly, Chapter 5, verse 20, and chapter 6, verse 1. We beg you. We beg you as though Christ himself were here pleading with you, be reconciled to God. Chapter 6, verse 1. As God's partners, we beg you not to toss aside this marvelous message of God's great kindness. Ask yourself this question. Have I ever begged anybody to come to Jesus? By my attitude or by my action, have I ever begged anybody to come to Jesus? And in most cases, the answer is no. Well, let them make up their own mind. After all, they want to go to hell. Just let them go. No, no, no. He says, as God's partner, we beg them. We beg them. We care enough about them to beg them. And finally... The laborer conforms himself to whatever is necessary for the building of the family of God. Look at verses 3 through 10 of chapter 6 of 2 Corinthians. Let me read it to you. Paul said, we try to live in such a way that no one will ever be offended or kept back from finding the Lord by the way we act, so that no one can find fault with us and blame it on the Lord. In fact, in everything we do, we try to show that we are true ministers of God. We patiently endure suffering and hardship and trouble of every kind. We've been beaten, put in jail, faced angry mobs, worked to exhaustion, stayed awake through sleepless nights of watching, and gone without food. We have proved ourselves to be what we claim by our wholesome lives and by our understanding of the gospel and by our patience. We've been kind and truly loving and filled with the Holy Spirit. We've been truthful with God's power helping us in all we do. All of the godly man's arsenal, weapons of defense and weapons of attack have been ours. We stand true to the Lord whether others honor us or despise us, whether they criticize us or commend us. We are honest, but they call us liars. And the world ignores us, but we are known to God. We live close to death, but here we are still very much alive. We've been injured, but kept from death. Our hearts ache, but at the same time, we have the joy of the Lord. We are poor, but we give rich spiritual gifts to others. We own nothing, and yet we enjoy everything. You see, I stay on a level of life, folks. I minister on a level that keeps me constantly aware of the tremendous hurts of people. Tomorrow at noon, this place will be more full than it is right now. A memorial service for a 20-year-old girl who suddenly died of an aneurysm. Gone that fast. And through touch with a family in this church, I'm involved in that service tomorrow. I met yesterday afternoon at 5 o'clock with that family at the mortuary. And we held that little private family service. And God came to the meeting. I depend on you for your prayers 
but you can depend on me that I will be there in the front line touching people who need to know Jesus Christ and sharing the straight gospel message with them in love and in compassion and an understanding. But folks, it is high time you understood that there's no way I can hire enough staff to do this job. That is not God's way to start with. Staff are just to be motivators. Staff are just to find ways to help people learn more. I dare say that most of you did not attend a 945 adult education class today. The scripture says the person that will not be taught is a fool. Major group of classes designed to help you grow and mature in your faith. And you consistently say, pass, pass. I don't need that. You do. You need to get serious about the things of God in 1986 like you've never been in all of your life. And I encourage you this morning, read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 through the end of that chapter and down through chapter 6 and verse 10 and have the courage to look at these areas of character and behavior and see where you fit. Stand together with me, will you please? Oh, we thank you, Father, that you've given us the Word of God. So clear, so powerful. You've outlined for us what our responsibilities are, and it's not just to sit around in this place once a week and do a nice little thing and enjoy the music and put a few dollars in the box and shake hands with our friends and go our way. We are to come here to be empowered to go into this community as the voice of God demonstrating that our faith is real and begging others to come to Jesus Christ. And Father, it is my prayer that we would open our hearts and let the Spirit of God deal with us individually about our needs. There are men and women in this place that have known the Lord for a long time that really haven't grown much in their concern for others. There's some in this place that are not yet converted. They need to fill out a card and put it in the box and let us sit with them and show them how they can come to know Christ. But most of all, there are believers in this place that have tried to tell themselves they're quite content to live as they've been living. I pray that in a great and powerful way, the Spirit of God would move upon this congregation this week and that some personal life decisions would be made that would move us into the center of doing the will of God. I pray this for the glory of God, not for the glory of Northwest Church or Buf Carriker or any staff anywhere, but for the glory of God. The issue is salvation. Deliver us from sidestepping that issue with our friends and our loved ones. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Good to have some time with you. See you this week. Bible studies are rolling. Everything's in full gear this week. Bethel, Awana, it's all going. See you there.